Marx and his doctoral thesis have been misunderstood for nearly 200 years, just as Epicurus has been misunderstood for 2,000 years. In the sixth episode, we mentioned that the young Hegelians valued the late Greek philosophy, and Marx especially valued Epicurus, considering him the greatest Enlightenment philosopher in Greece. Next, we discuss what is not the Epicurus philosophy, the principles of science. The significance of Marx's doctoral thesis and the significance of Epicureanism to Marxism. Finally, we study the main text of the doctoral. What is not the Epicurus philosophy? First, Epicurus is not a philosophy of hedonism. Epicurus is a philosophy of the individual, emphasizing peace and happiness. It is consistent with the philosophy of Zhuangzi in China during the same period. Peace and seclusion, resisting alienation, and pursuing happiness, joy, and carefree wandering. But he was slandered as a philosophy of hedonism by religious people who hated his atheism. Second, Epicurus physics is not fabricated or naive. This is the slander or parroting of scholars for two thousand years. It is not a plagiarism of Democritus' atomic theory, but materialism. Systems theory, emphasis on scientific positivism and human finiteness. It opposes surmise and superstition in Greek culture and is an advanced scientific philosophy and physics concept. Marx chose such a master of happy, a master of materialism and free will as the core of his doctoral thesis. The principles of science of the Epicurean school first. Emphasize scientific hypotheses and the limited cognition of human beings, an object to surmise and myths of other Greek scholars about nature. Epicurus wrote that the waxing and waning of the moon can be due to the moon's rotation, or due to the specific shape of the clouds, or due to something blocking it, or in other ways. The moon can shine by itself or receive light from the sun. The key is not to be too partial to one reason and unreasonably reject other reasons, because one should notice that human cognition has its limits. The reason should be consistent with sensory experience. Second, studying science is for human happiness. The importance of valuing natural science at that time was to break superstition. Epicurus wrote that the soul is composed of particles. And exists only by accidental mixture and will die. The entire object in general acquires a special, not simply combined, inherent essence from all its characteristics. Due to the fear of pain, disease, and death, people often imagine as need for protective gods, and people become children. Panic makes people lose their autonomy and even their sanity. In secluded places. They carry the shackles of misfortune on their backs, pray to the gods, and sacrifice black goats to the dead. In their corrupt hearts, bad luck gathers new strength and evokes endless disasters of fanatical worship again. This is just core of the famous work *Escape from Freedom* by the Marxist psychologist Eric Fromm. What is the significance of Marx's doctoral thesis? First. He completed the philosophical exploration in books, absorbed the essence, especially Hegel and Epicurus. He understood how to be a philosopher and the philosophy of philosophy. Those mediocre people, such as the dogmatists of the Hegelian school, are just players of words, profiteers in the knowledge business field and the ideological officialdom. What they believe in is the official philosophy of Prussia and the favor of the Minister of Education and Culture, rather than philosophical truth. They, as he wrote, standing in a small corner of the buttocks of a certain philosophical giant in the past. Second, Marx deeply empathized with the fate of Epicurus. Epicurus was slandered and misunderstood for two thousand years. Because he opposed religious superstition, and even was misunderstood and revised by his own disciples and sects, this is the price that revolutionaries have to pay. He wrote that as long as there is still a drop of blood in philosophy in its heart that wants to conquer the world and be absolutely free, 
it will always declare to its opponents in Epicurus' words, it is not the one who abandons the gods that everyone worships who is blasphemous, but the one who imposes the opinions of everyone on the gods. Prometheus' confession, all in all, I hate all the gods, is the confession of philosophy itself. Prometheus is the noblest saint and martyr in the history of philosophy. Marx has already prepared for martyrdom. His life was marked by arrests, wanted notices, exile, poverty, the death of his daughter without money for burial, being slandered, fabricated, and attacked. But like Prometheus, he wanted to pass on the fire of liberating mankind from the capitalist world, namely the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. When Marx discussed the controversy about Epicurus, he wrote, Spinoza said that ignorance is not an argument. If everyone deletes what he does not understand in the works of the ancients, we will soon get a blank slate. Marxism is just like this. After more than a hundred years of deletion, it has become a blank slate. Third, he found his own destined philosophy. He was an Epicurean throughout his life. Decades later, in Das Kapital and its manuscripts, he mentioned Epicurus many times. While Marx calmly faced death in his later years, his favorite quote was Epicurus saying, Death is not the misfortune of the deceased, but of the living. Many things happened to Marx during his years at university. He proposed, got engaged, corresponded. His father died of serious illness. His mother disliked him for not studying for promotion and wealth, becoming a philosophy nerd and did not give him a piece of inheritance and no longer supported his expenses during his university years. Jenny's family put pressure on Jenny and also had conflicts with Mark's mother, Prussia became more and more reactionary and began to expel the Hegelians as one leader of young Hegelians. The difficulty of obtaining a teaching position was increasing and the difficulty of obtaining a teaching position to give Jenny a stable life and secular recognition was getting higher and higher. The secular fate caused great psychological torture to this simple, intelligent, and inexperienced young man and made him mature rapidly. Epicurus' philosophy of death, freedom, happiness, and joy must have given him great comfort. What is the significance of Epicurus' philosophy to Marxism? One is humanism. Epicurus' philosophy is the philosophy of pursuing the happiness and joy of every ordinary person. In humanism, there is the basic belief that everyone can be happy and wise, which is the basis of the historical view of the masses and historical materialism. In the historical view of the Epicurean school, the people history view and simple historical materialism are also reflected. While idealism, on the surface, exaggerates the initiative of human beings, but in fact boasts the leading role of a few elites and regards the masses as the mob and the rabble. Choosing the historical view of the masses or the historical view of the elites, Marx was already destined to part ways with the increasingly elitist young Hegelians such as Bauer. Second, the coordination of materialism and free will. This is also the reason why Marx admired Epicurus' materialism, but still admired idealism in his doctoral thesis. The beginning of Theses on Feuerbach, written three years later, is very clear. The main shortcoming of all previous materialism, including Feuerbach's materialism, is that things, reality, and sensibility are only understood from the objective or intuitive form, not as human, sensible activities subjectivity, and practical aspects. As a result, the active aspect was developed by idealism, of course, only abstractly developed, because idealism of course does not know real, sensible activities. How to combine objective materialism and subjective initiative well tests the realm of materialist philosophers. Epicurus is doing his best. Marx needed three or four years to complete this process. Next, we introduce the main text of the doctoral thesis. In the first chapter, Marx compared the epistemology of Epicurus and Democritus. 
Democritus believes that the atoms and void is real, and sensory phenomena are subjective illusions, while sensory phenomena are the only real objects, and they are changing and unstable. So confusion and contradiction are hidden in his philosophy. Epicurus believes that sensory phenomena are objective phenomena. The difference in epistemology is reflected in different practices. Democritus believes that principles have no reality and are outside existence. Although sensory perception is a subjective illusion, it also breaks away from the principle and has its own independent reality. As the only real object, it has value and significance. He has nothing to rely on. Philosophy does not satisfy him. He believes that real knowledge has no content, and the knowledge that can provide him with content has no authenticity. So he had to be passionate about empirical knowledge and strive to become a learned person. Was proud that he had traveled to the most countries and regions, listened to the most scholars' lectures, and mastered the most subjects. While Epicurus regarded the phenomenal world as real, he was not greedy for empirical knowledge. Because he was satisfied and happy in philosophy, Epicurus left his garden in Athens only two or three times, not for research but to visit friends. According to his opinion, accumulating too much empirical knowledge is of no help in achieving true perfection. An Epicurean scholar said, "Those who will think that they should recite what even children would be ashamed of not knowing until old age are ignorant people." Democritus believes that everything is inevitable and there is no contingency. Epicurus said that the necessity is not the master of all things. Some things are contingent, and some depend on human subjective arbitrariness. The future is neither completely in our grasp nor completely out of our grasp. Therefore, it is better to believe in myths about gods than to be a slave of fate, as physicists say. Because myths still leave a little hope, while fate is an unfeeling necessity, it can be seen that Epicurus clearly opposes mechanical materialism. Velleius, an Epicurean, said something similar about Stoic philosophy. There is a philosophy that, like old and ignorant women, believes that everything happens because of fate. How should we evaluate this philosophy? Epicurus saved us and made us free. In the second chapter, Marx discusses Epicurus' atomic theory of philosophy. To better understand, we supplement some of Epicurus' philosophy of religion, view of death, view of life, and view of history. Democritus believed that atoms have two types of motion: the straight downward fall affected by gravity and mutual repulsion. Epicurus hypothesized a third type: the deflection of atoms from the straight line. A slight offset in an uncertain time and space. Many people ridiculed this. Marx was also ridiculed for highly praising this point in his doctoral thesis. Lucretius wrote, "If all movements always form a long chain, causes follow one after another infinitely. If atoms do not start a new movement through deflection to break the iron law of fate, how could creatures on the earth have their free will?" The slight offset prevents the mind from obeying necessity in all behaviors and frees it from being enslaved and forced to endure suffering and torture. This hypothesis is vigorous. According to the framework of quantum mechanics nowadays, electrons exist in the form of probability clouds with wave-particle duality, not mechanical motion. The complexity of the atomic structure leads to molecular diversity and biochemical diversity. So can life and human intelligence evolve. Feynman wrote that if all scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence was left to contain the most information with the fewest words, that is the atomic hypothesis. That everything is composed of atoms, some tiny particles that are in eternal motion. Slightly separated and attract each other, and repel each other when squeezed. The pioneers of quantum mechanics, Heisenberg and Pauli, all respected the atomic theory of Greek philosophy. Marx quoted a sentence: "Epicurus assumed the existence of atoms 
in order to lay an immortal foundation for nature. What was important to him was the individuality of the substantiality of matter. Marx used the Hegelian dialectical system to understand Epicurus' physical philosophy. The straight downward movement of atoms is mechanical, forced, and non-independent, while deflection is free and independent. Epicurus expressed the materiality of atoms through the straight movement of atoms, and realized the formal stipulation of atoms through deflection from the straight line. Therefore, Lucretius correctly asserted that deflection broke the bondage of fate. Deflection expresses the real soul of atoms, the concept of abstract individuality. Through deflection, the contradictions between materiality and form, essence and existence are all realized, and the atomic concept and atomic theory are also completed. This is inherent dialectical factor in the thoughts of ancient Greek philosophers. Epicurus extended the concept of repulsion to other fields such as contracts in the political field and friendship in the social field. Marx also wrote with reference to this extension that a person is no longer a natural product that is, a social product and breaks the relative existence within himself that is, desire and pure natural force only when the person he relates to is another individual. Three years later in Theses on Feuerbach, Marx wrote that the essence of man is the sum of all social relations. Epicurus' philosophy of religion opposed the theory of creation by gods, who is powerful enough to rule the vast universe. The world was certainly not created for us by divine power because there are far too many flaws in the existing world. People can only struggle hard, often holding rough hoes and lamenting the difficulty of life and pushing the iron plow to dig the soil. If it were not for us to turn over the fertile soil blocks and dig ditches with plow blades to make the large estate produce, nothing would grow automatically. The gods avoid the world, are indifferent to the world, and laugh outside the world. People once laughed at these gods of Epicurus. Plutarch said, this doctrine of the gods can eliminate fear and superstition and make our relationship with the gods, like our relationship with the fish in the Hyrcanian Sea, harmless and useless. Marx wrote, because nature is not well arranged, gods exist. Because the irrational world exists, gods exist. Epicurus view of these atoms are the entities of nature. Everything is produced by atoms, and everything is decomposed into atoms. The phenomenal world is constantly changing, destroying, and forming. Everything that is born from the earth will return to the earth again. Death does not completely destroy matter, so they can recombine with other elements. Do not believe that those things that float on the surface of objects and are unstable and impermanent can always reside in atoms. The death of nature becomes the immortal entity of nature. Believe that death has nothing to do with us because all good and bad are in sensation, and death is the disappearance of sensation. The biggest of all bad things, death, has nothing to do with us. When we are alive, death has not yet come. When death comes, we are no longer here. Epicurus view of life and soul. A single hand or any separated part of our body cannot maintain the function of sensation. Sensation is born in the whole of living things. Sensation is impossible without the atomic combination. That is, there is no soul outside atoms. Criticize teleology. Our organs were not invented intentionally. The tongue existed before language. So many atoms in so many ways. Over endless time, under frequent collisions, always moving and meeting in countless ways, trying all kinds of combinations. Some particles that suddenly aggregated together became the beginnings of great things the earth, the sea, the sky, and living things and connected to produce anything imaginable. In the view of history of Lucretius, an ancient person whom Marx called the one who understood Epicurus best, there is simple historical materialism. At first, human beings lived in primitive tribes. 
The birth of language was no essentially different from the sound communication of animals. Later, human beings suffered from fighting and killing each other and were willing to abide by laws and strict legal provisions. State laws emerged. Then, because of people's fear and myths of nature, religion emerged. With the development of civilization, human beings invented metal tools and weapons. The good things of human civilization, such as ships and agriculture, city defenses and laws, weapons, roads, clothing, poetry and paintings, statues, were produced by practice and the attempts of an active mind. In Lucretius' view of history, mentioned the alienation of human beings. Before humans invented singing, they imitated the chirping of birds with their mouths. Peasants blew out tunes from the hollow tubes of hemlock. These beautiful tunes soothed their hearts and brought joy after they were full of food and drink. People often lay on the soft grass in groups of three or five, stretching their legs and lying at will by the stream. They enjoyed their bodies without spending much money, especially in the fine weather and the warm spring. This is a good time for people to joke, chat, and have fun because it is full of strong rural charm. They would decorate their heads and shoulders with garlands woven from flowers and leaves, play improvisationally, and jump up happily, dancing clumsily with their heavy feet on Mother Earth. When they were awake, they blew out various long tones and undulating tunes at the end of the reed pipe with their curved lips. Until now, people still maintain this tradition and know how to blow out various melodies. But compared with the indigenous residents in the past, they cannot get more happiness from it. Before we encounter something more lovely, the things at hand give us the greatest happiness and seem to be enough as long as we have them. Once something better is discovered later, these pleasures are lost. Human beings are often blindly engaged in hard labor in vain and without gain, spending their years in illusory worries. Just because they do not know to what extent the possession of property is the limit, nor do they know to what extent the increase in true happiness will stop. In this way, endless desires gradually drag human beings into war and the abyss. Epicurean philosophy and Zwangzi's philosophy discuss the alienation of humans from two dimensions. The first is the loss of freedom, being enslaved by power, capital, and the mode of production. Humans cannot achieve freedom independently outside of society, just as a country cannot independently build socialism. The second is the loss of happiness. Finding happiness is easier than finding freedom. Both Epicurean philosophy and Zwangzi's philosophy accept the inevitability of being constrained and unfree, and seek the joy of unity between heaven and man. Marxism, on the other hand, is a philosophy that seeks freedom. Epicurean philosophy of astronomy the veneration of celestial bodies was a form of worship followed by all Greek philosophers. Epicurus opposed the views of the entire Greek nation. Epicurus said, the greatest confusion of the human mind originates from the belief that celestial bodies are blessed and indestructible. Any explanation is acceptable. However, mythology must be excluded. We must grasp phenomena and sensory perception. Those who, in the celestial phenomena, only recognize the uniform, eternal, and divine, are falling into tricks of astrologers. They have crossed the boundaries of natural science and embraced mythology. When celestial bodies are said to be the accidental combination of atoms, and the processes occurring in the celestial bodies are said to be the accidental motion of these atoms, the superstition of the Stoics and their entire view have been refuted. The eternal nature of celestial bodies is therefore denied. Lucretius wrote, the number of atoms is so vast, that it cannot be counted out in the span of existence. And if there exist similar forces and natures that can throw atoms together in the same way as they are in our world, then it must be admitted that there are other worlds, different human races, and generations of beasts elsewhere. The sky, the earth, the sun, the moon, the ocean, 
and all other things exist, are not unique, but have an infinite number. Marx wrote that Epicurus was the greatest Greek Enlightenment thinker, and he was worthy of the praise of Lucretius. A Greek has dared to raise the eyes of ordinary people, to face tyranny, to struggle bravely whether it is the legends of gods, or the thunder and lightning in the sky, nothing can scare him. Marx concludes with a Hegelian-style deduction in the notes of the paper Marx wrote, we remind Herr Schelling to pay attention to the conclusion of his early works, to the excellent human beings, the time has come when we can no longer tolerate human beings to weep for losing the shackles on their bodies. If it had already come in 1795, then what should be said in 1841? As a will force philosophy necessarily interacts with the external world becoming a practical force. Due to the interaction and integration between philosophy and the world, on the one hand, philosophy continuously abandons its inherent shortcomings and defects, and on the other hand, the world continues to rationalize. The result is that the philosophization of the world is also the worldization of philosophy. How to coordinate materialism and free will, ideology and materiality, subjectivity and objectivity, is a challenge for modern philosophers. Marx and Engels still needed a few years to jointly reach dialectical materialism and historical materialism.